all over the world. There's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it would be. All over the world, there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it would be. All over the world, there's a mighty revelation of the glory stand up and uh, sing praises to the Lord this morning.
There's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. There's a peace. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. A victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise. Only before my God, fall on my knees and rise, I will rise. There's a day that's drawing near, when this darkness breaks to light, and the shadows disappear. And my faith shall be my eye. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. A victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name.
headed this morning. Hallelujah. Can I hear an amen? I want to close my eyes because I can't see any of you. I'll just go by sound this morning. Can I hear an amen this morning? Hallelujah. I will rise. Thank you, Ben. And your beautiful daughter. She's going to be uh, at the high school court. Is that right, Ben? Homecoming, Homecoming court. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sarah Kate, well done, honey. She's been with us a long time. She's had, she was four years old. And she's still singing, still looking pretty. And uh, we're very proud of the Martin family. We uh, are. Let me just say this when I'm at it, that uh, Ben's wife, Catherine, heads up our hospitality group. And there's about 10 people that do breakfasts every Sunday. That I see the more people coming in and really enjoying. And it's nice to see that even Swanee police came this morning. Yeah. Hallelujah. Did you get your donut, Sergeant? Did you get your donut? No. Okay, just check. It's all right. That was low blow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When he first came in, I thought he was looking for me, but was I glad when he passed me by. Praise God. It's good to see every one of you. What a joy it is for us to come together and just enjoy the Lord together. Just to worship him, to praise his name, and to appreciate all that he's done for us. Can I hear an amen? amen. He's worthy of our praise uh, this morning. And I'm just so grateful to see every one of you, all you beautiful families together in the house of the Lord. We've got Bella, Marshall, and they brought Anne. Is it Anne? Yeah. Anne with them today. Good to see you. And uh, just pray that you'll enjoy the service. And uh, just, I just love Jesus this morning. I would like us to turn in, in our Bibles this morning to Psalm 118. 118. 118. Hallelujah. Verse 8, it says these words. Good advice for us all. It is better to trust the Lord than put confidence in man. How many of us this morning have put confidence in men or women or whoever it is, put our confidence in them and we've been let down by man? But let me tell you, Jesus will never let you down. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princesses or princes. No matter what we are facing, many of us have different trials and tribulations and things that come to hold us back. The devil is actively yes. going about like a roaring lion, yes. seeking whom he can devour. He's after you. If he can't get to you, he'll get to your family. If he can't get to your family, he'll get to your health. If he can't get to your health, he'll go for your finances. Yes. But he's actively. What happens when somebody's actively out to annoy you or yeah. to destroy you or to do you damage? He, that's what the devil is. He's seeking, actively to, seeking to devour us and to kill us. Yes. And, but if we're aware of his devices, Amen. we can put up a blockade or we can adjust accordingly. No matter what we are facing this morning, every one of us today facing different things. Sometimes we're going through a really rough time. And when we're going through a rough time, it's, I'm thankful that I've got brothers and sisters that I can look to to help me yes. in difficult times and to help lift me up to come alongside and to be with me when I'm down. And then when I'm up and they're down, then I can reciprocate and do the same thing and be there for them. Thankful for that. And that's why we have our church. Yeah. That's why we have our brothers and sisters. That's why when we've got Jesus living in our heart and we're living that life, that Jesus, he does really make the difference in our hearts and our lives. So what, anything that we're facing this morning, our strength and our hope and victory comes from the Lord. Let me encourage you. That's where it comes. You're having a rough time difficult time. Seek the Lord. Look to Him. That Psalm 91, Ursula's one of her favorite ones is, 
Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. The, the secret is to abide in that secret place with the Lord. It's the Lord that gives us his strength. It's the Lord that gives us wisdom to carry on how we need to be. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So no matter what you're facing today, he's got you. He's got you covered. I just encourage you to, to trust him this morning. Praise the Lord. Josh coming? Okay, praise God. I'll hold off. That's something special planned for Joshy today, but God is good. But this is uh, about how September the 11th, yeah. which is 9-11. What, what year was that? 20, about 20 years ago? 2001. So what makes it how many? 22 years ago. There was something uh, that comes to our memory. Some of us will never forget. Some of us will remember where we were when we looked up into the TV and the news was going and all of a sudden you see this black flat thing going into the, the buildings. Back then, many of us have different memories of that. Some who are younger maybe don't remember it, but we should remember and we should never forget those things. And one of the things I remember, yes, it was a disaster. Yes, it was horrific. We have our memories of that. But also, I remember people driving around with their pickup trucks with the flag of the United yeah. States of America flying high. Oh. And we became patriotic once more and we joined together and we were in one accord. Yeah. Psalm 133, it says, how good yeah. and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity and harmony. Yeah. And as we're remembering tomorrow being September 11th, we should also remember, yes, the disaster. Yes, the things that happened, the before and after that, and these years that have gone on. We should never forget. We should never forget. But also, we need to remember how it brought this nation, once again, back together. And that's what we need as a nation, the United States of America. Great Britain needs it, we all need it. We need to be in unity and harmony. And it tells you that, clearly in Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is. And I love it when I can come together, my brothers and sisters, whether we're having a bad day or a good day, we can encourage one another. There are people in here that have encouraged me and blessed me when I've been down, and I know, God willing, that I've been able to do the same for them. So this morning, just remember that. Remember what God's done for you. Remember the blessings. Remember, I remember where he's taken me from from the gutter to where I am today. And I'm so thankful, and I'll never forget that night that I bowed the knee and accepted him as my Lord and Savior. So I just encourage you this morning, and I have got something ready for, for you at the back, Christy, just a little thing. Just watch this video. Lights, camera, action. When it first happened, the minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days, and the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built, wars were fought, and victims' names were read. Survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. 
God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. And we will always remember. Hallelujah. When the thief comes to rob, steal, and destroy. I didn't know that was in that part. That's true. I didn't. I mean, I watched the thing, but it never clicked. Hallelujah. This morning, let us remember those who lost their lives in that great day. Let us remember the firemen that ran into the buildings. Remember the police officers that sacrificed their lives for the sake of others. Remember our police and our soldiers and everyone at this time. You'll see a plaque when you come in the door for us to pray for our servicemen, yeah. our army, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, all the different services, police, fire. Remember them all in prayer. We need to lift them up every day. These are strange times we're all living in. But you know, God is good, God is faithful, and God is still on the throne. Let's keep our eyes to him. Let's live our lives like the word says to us to do. Do unto others as we like to be done to ourselves. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me say that uh, if our tithes and offerings, Bill Palmer comes in and he takes the envelope from the back of his seat and he fills it out and he puts in where, where he wants the offering to go to. And then he takes the box and when he leaves, there's a plate at the back at that side. We just used to have it at that side, but I didn't want to, anyone to miss out. So I put one at that side as well. So no matter what door you go out, there's an offering plate for you. I want to say this, that we are so grateful for you, for your faithfulness, your kindness, and your love. And because of that, we're able to do all the things we do behind the scenes. On September the 17th, Samaritan's Purse, a representative will be coming here to give us a little testimony of their mission, their ministry, and what they do. And I believe in Franklin Graham and Billy Graham and all they've done. They've proved themselves. They're on record. Yeah. Nobody can deny the good things that they do. So they're going to come and share a little bit, just for about 10 minutes on, on the 17th to share with us. So that will be on the 17th of September. All right? Praise the Lord. The offering is back there. I'm just going to pray over that right now so that you feel free to, to give as the Lord has truly blessed you. Did I recognize? I did recognize you, didn't I? Uh, 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 Bella, right? Your husband and your daughter, right? Hallelujah. See how short my memory is? <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Father, we're just so grateful for each other today and we just pray your blessing be upon in each and every one. Lord, as we will not leave this place as we've come, but be wonderfully blessed in your precious name. You say in your word where two or three are gathered, yeah. you're right here with us. And I believe that, Lord. I'm looking for your anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be in this place. That, Lord, whatever the deed may be that you will undertake and that you'll bless and that you'll encourage each and every one. For those that are not here today, I ask you, Lord, just to bless them. And wherever they are, whatever they're doing, whatever they find themselves, Lord, I ask you just to undertake for them. All those that are on our hearts, Lord, today with different things, we pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you'll come close to them, draw alongside and minister to them, to them like you alone can. In Jesus, your wonderful name. Praise the Lord. This morning... As we come together around the communion table, some people maybe have never... I always remember me when I first... I didn't understand about the communion table. I didn't understand about the breaking of bread and the drinking of the wine. They call it communion or the table of the Lord. Many different names for it. But it all means one thing. It's an opportunity for us, if we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
We've accepted him into our hearts and lives that we can come together and this table is spread for us. What I mean by that is inside these little trays, you've already got them, is a little cup. And in the cup, there's a little cup of juice and underneath there, so it's easy to open. I hope you notice we've got new ones. Easy to open. And you can take the bread. And when you get the bread, the bread is symbolic. It's not the body of Christ, but it's symbolic of his body that was broken for us on the cross at Calvary. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So as we come together this morning, and as I read the scripture, you'll have the opportunity to take the bread and to take the juice, and we'll do that in remembrance of him. The scripture says in Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Lovely verse from verse 28. It encourages us. This is our table. This is for you and it's for me. It's our opportunity. I can't examine your life and tell you if you're right or wrong. Have enough ado. Have enough ado. Sorry, I'm speaking Scottish. Have enough ado looking inside my own heart. But you have the opportunity to look inside your heart. And if you think there's something that needs to be put right in your life, you can do it right now. What an opportunity. When you're there just facing the table, and the table says, in remembrance of me. Today, we remembered tomorrow is 9-11, that horrible, horrendous thing that happened to our nation. But we're remembering what happened. We're remembering all those souls that lost their lives, all those that ran and gave their life for others, to help others, to save others. We're remembering the unity that it brought to our nation, although the Bible does say that all things work together for good. You can hard to see that to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. But I believe that the Lord can work good through anything. Whatever God wants to do, he can do it and through us. So this morning, my brothers, my sisters, that's you and that's me. Know that I love you, every one of you. You mean a lot to me. But there's a man that loves you far greater than I could ever do. And his name is Jesus. And he loved you enough to go to a cross and allowed his body to be beaten and bruised and his blood to be shed on a cross at Calvary so that you and I may have eternal life with him. That's what we're remembering today, that sacrifice. Can you imagine what it's like that someone that loves you enough that he'd give his life for you? That's what Jesus did. Jesus did it because he loved me and he loved you. And as we're just taking a little time, just why don't you just close your eyes for a moment? Don't bow your head, just close your eyes and just look to him, realizing afresh and give him the opportunity to hear your voice as you give him thanks this morning, as we remember in that sacrifice. Oh Jesus, I thank you so much for all that you've done for me, how you lifted me out of the miry clay place my feet on solid ground. All the blessings that I've seen you do in my heart and in my life, and all the unseen blessings that you've done when you've carried me along the way. Lord Jesus, I give you thanks this morning with a grateful heart. I thank you for this congregation that's come together as we join together as brothers and sisters to remember you, to remember that sacrifice, 
to remember that you allowed your body to be beaten, knowing what was coming ahead of you. You even said, if it be your will, Lord, take this from me. But nevertheless, your will be done. Jesus did it for you and me. And I, for one, want to be one that would come back and give him thanks with a thankful and a grateful heart. In Jesus' name, Lord, minister to each and every one this morning as we take time to celebrate the greatest sacrifice, the greatest love story that's ever been told. In your precious name, I give you thanks. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Galatians. And this week we're still in Galatians chapter 4. And a quick recap. So Paul is in writing his letter to the church in Galatia. And he is... Uh, uh, He's, he heard what has happened to the Galatians. He's heard that they, they started their newfound faith. They started uh, uh, their church in Galatia. Paul helped start it. And, he, and Paul heard how there was people who came in 
and told these Galatians, Yes, Jesus, but if you want the full enchilada, if you want the full experience, if you want all that God wants to have for you, well, you need to get circumcised. And so, and then that's how that crowd crept in and troubled the Galatians. Because you see, they had been given this wonderful good news and promise from Paul that Christ alone had saved them from their sins through his death and through his resurrection. And so they they originally started off with this wonderful good news and they started off strong. But then just that little bit of doubt, that little bit of voice, that little bit of... And here's the funny thing about this. The Bible or scholars refer to this crowd as Judaizers. They were... People who said that, hey, you still needed to do this law that was given to us and our forefathers because we are children of Abraham, right? So we need to be acting like children of Abraham and following along this, this route. And that's all, and I'm pretty confident and sure, I could be wrong, but just going with what I know of history and what I know of people, and maybe I know about myself, these people that came into the church of Galatia and caused such a fuss, I'm pretty sure they thought they were doing the right thing. They didn't probably go in there thinking, this is how we're going to ruin this whole Christian show. We're going to come in there and we're just going to mess it all up. They probably thought in their best intentions that they were doing something right, that they were helping, that they were correcting. They were standing up for what they knew was right in God's law. And so Paul sees what's going on and he Pitches a fit in this letter because the gospel is at stake. The gospel is at stake. And so we see here in Galatians 4, starting with verse 21, we see Paul say this now in his letter to the church in Galatia and to us this morning as well. Verse 21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, Bearing children for slavery, she is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman." May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Paul is saying here, okay, so you want to go by the law? Is that how you want want the law to be back in play? You want to go back to the law? Since through it you think you will make yourself wise, then I will talk to you about the law. We read here where Paul is saying, don't you know that there are two children? There is a child of the promise. And there is a child of performance. And you who think, you who live by the law, that you are the child of the promise? Did you not pay attention to the story? So Abraham can't wait for God to do only what God can do. Provide a way according to his promise. And God made a promise to bring a savior through Abraham. The problem problem was Abraham and his elderly wife, Sarah, had no children. God made a promise to very old Abraham and very old Sarah 
that they would have a son. And he promised them that. God promised something that cannot and should not happen. God made a promise to them. So Sarah, but so in this issue, they saw in their own simple thinking, their own way of looking at things, how can this happen? We know God promised this. Maybe this is something that we need to work on. Maybe this is something that we need to help make happen. So Sarah gave her maidservant, Hagar, to her husband to bear a child in an ill-conceived plan. Abraham, through his own effort, his own decision, makes a baby. He takes a promise and turns it into performance. He took God's promise and through his own effort, ability, choosing, decision, turned from God's promise and hoped in his own performance instead. It backfired, of course, causing great discord in the family. Not just their immediate family, but a ripple effect that would last up until our time also. Eventually, God comes through, as he always does, and keeps his promise. And Sarah gives birth to Isaac, who will carry on the line of the Savior. Which, if you are following the story closely, the promise of Isaac was not only to bless Abraham and Sarah right then, but was to also bless them and all of us forever. For it was through the line of Isaac that eventually would come Jesus Christ, the promised seed, the same promised seed that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden is the same promised seed that was given to Abraham when God said, through your seed, all the world will be blessed. Jesus Christ is that promised seed. That is why the promise was so important and and why God would make a way, his way come to pass. For it was all a part of his plan to save us by sending Jesus, 100% God and also 100% man. And I take great solace in this as well because I can't wreck God's plan. If I could wreck God's plan, God's plan would be wrecked. But God, when he promises something, is all-powerful and all-sovereign and all-sufficient to make his promise come through. So when he promises to me and he promises to you that you are not a slave, but a son and an heir, he keeps his promise. And the wonderful thing about God is that when he says something is, that is, is what it's supposed to be and is what God says. So if God says and declares you are righteous on account of his son, guess what? You are righteous out of the declaration of God on account of Christ and his dying and rising for you. Ishmael is the son of a slave, but Isaac is freeborn. The freeborn son, not the slave son, will inherit the family estate. Paul then speaks about the causes of their births. Ishmael, the child of performance, but Isaac was born of God's promise. Through this allegory that Paul makes, the main point emerges. The Galatians were sons of the promise, just like Isaac. The, problem, the gospel made them free from sin and the death which follows sin. They were heirs to the heavenly Jerusalem. They were not slaves, yet they were tempted to enslave themselves again. They had been betwixt by preachers who led them to believe that they needed to follow certain laws like circumcision to be a part of God's family and inherit the heavenly estate. Paul is perplexed that his spiritual children could be so easily duped. And it's funny because a lot of times I relate so much to the Galatians. Is there anyone else that when they're reading this, they're like, oh, foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you? It's like Paul saying, oh, foolish Zach, who has bewitched bewitched you? It is natural. When I look at anything other than Christ, I doubt the promise. 
When I look at me and my performance, I doubt the promise. When I look at Zach Cole and how I am doing, I doubt the promise. When I look at Jesus, I don't doubt the promise at all. I don't doubt because I see him and what he has done. And here's good news for those who doubt. You are in good company. You are in a lot of company. Doubts are a real thing. And here's some encouragement for those who have doubts. If you were not saved, you wouldn't care you had doubts. If you were not saved, you wouldn't care if this was true or if this was not. And the devil is there to give you doubts. The devil is there to always, always, always attack God's word and always attack the promise. Did God really say you would die? Did God really say you shouldn't eat the fruit? Oh, he just doesn't want you to be like him. Did God really say, did God really say, he's always attacking God's word? Always. So when God says he loves you, he means it. When God says you are forgiven, he means it. When he says you are free, he means it. He says you will be where he is one day. He means it. He says that whenever two or more are gathering in his name, he is there in the midst and he means it. That means he is right here right now because two or more are here and we are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and he's not welcome for us to be perfect he's not welcome for us to sing loud we can if we want to he's not waiting for us to get everything right together we are gathered in his name and he promised he would be here because he said he would be Paul is perplexed that his spiritual children could be so easily duped had he not preached the gospel to them Had he not taught them right, why would they want to enslave themselves to the law once again? They have been set free because we naturally don't like a gift. You might be saying, oh, I like gifts. We naturally, naturally in our sin nature, do not like gifts. Oh, I got to pay for it. Oh, I got to earn it. Oh, no, now now I've got to give something back in the future because they gave me this wonderful gift. And now I can't look ungrateful. And I've got to do all these things. You don't earn a gift. You receive a gift. If you can earn a gift, it's not a gift. It is a wage. It is something you earned. A gift... It's something that's given by the giver. Your job in a gift is to receive the gift. Just like Christmas. Just like Christmas. Present under the tree, your name on it. Go and open it. It's yours. The Galatians did not, nor could they follow any law that would impress God. God loved them, period. So much so that Christ became man to live a perfect life in their place. Christ's righteousness became their righteousness. They were righteous not by, not by being circumcised or following any other custom, but by Christ alone. They were righteous by faith. So Paul's allegory wasn't really about anything else but the two kinds of righteousness. Ishmael's birth was out of human devising. It was born out of the will of two people. Sarah hatched the plan and Abraham carried it out. Ishmael was conceived and born in the ordinary way, a human way. They thought they would do God's work. This was flat out unbelief. This was an attempt at righteousness by human devising, a righteousness by law. In contrast, Isaac's birth was anything but normal. His parents were old, like great-grandparent old. Sarah was barren, but God promised. And when God speaks, it is so. There was no planning this birth. Abraham and Sarah could only trust. And even though they wavered, Abraham believed. 
He believed despite his and his wife's old flesh. He looked at his body and Sarah's body and saw impossibility. He had to go by faith because no reasonable man could believe that a child could be born of Sarah without supernatural help. The Galatians, both Jews and Gentile, were sons of Abraham, not because of their ethnicity, not because they followed the Old Testament ceremonial law or any other law for that matter. They were freeborn because they had been reborn in Christ. They were free. To put oneself under this burden of pleasing God by law was insane. But insanity is our default position. This is because sin is insane. It makes no sense. This is ultimately why Paul's allegory is hard for us to understand. It's not because we have to sift through Paul's string of pictures to arrive at the main point. It is because our default position is sin. Our sinful nature knows nothing but a righteousness by law. It's our greatest insanity. We simply cannot shake this desire to be righteous by our own actions. It even affects the way we look at Scripture, especially this particular story. I know that my mind first goes to the character of Hagar and Ishmael on the one hand and Sarah and Isaac on the other. One is bad and the other is good. There must be something about Sarah and Isaac that makes them better than the slaves. But the Genesis account gives no no such evidence. Sarah receives little sympathy from me. If anything, Hagar is the obedient one. She's no saint, but think about the position this power couple of Abraham and Sarah put her in. And Ishmael? So he picked on his little half-brother. How would you look at the golden boy, Isaac? If that was you and you were in that situation, how would you look at Isaac? Take note that the child of performance taunts the child of the promise. Because the child of performance is ultimately illegitimate. And so, the one that is the child of performance must be cast out of the camp. And Paul's saying to the Galatians and to us today... You, you who are saying to these people, he's now saying to the people who are, the people who came in and told this to the Galatians, you, you who are saying to these people that they need to perform more in order to get more, you are the one who must be cast outside of the camp. It's me. It's you. So as we ask this question, is this problem still a problem? Yes. But also, I think the solution to when we hear these voices in our hearts, around us, is the right solution of the law and the gospel and its true value. You want the law? Then let me kill you with the law. The way out of this until Christ returns is law and gospel preaching. The law first, and then the gospel. The law in all its fullness, and the gospel in all its goodness. When I hear these voices of do more, try harder, when it stirs in my heart and do its work, I, hear, I need to hear all that I need to do, what all I am commanded to do. Let it push me and drive me out of the camp. Kill me and then push me into the arms of Jesus Christ, who will look at me and say, having been driven from the place of performance and reliance on my own effort and ability to get more and experience more in my life, Jesus can then, by the preaching of the gospel, take me by the face and look at me and say, you're not a slave. You're a son. You're not a slave. You're a son. Live. You who are dead, rise. Live. Because I live, you too shall live. You're not a slave. You're a son. You're a son. An heir to the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Our default position is a righteousness by law. There must be something in these tragic characters that is redeemable. There must be some lesson for my life I can glean from this story. We even make the gift of faith into an accomplishment. We are proud to offer to God. Maybe that's the lesson of Hagar and Sarah, we think. Sarah believed and Hagar didn't. We have no evidence of that. The point is that the whole lot was wicked. And so were the Galatian Christians. And so are we. Our plans stink. Our promises are worthless. And yet here we are, constantly trying to usurp God as if his promises were not good enough. 
Here we are once again trying to be righteous by human devising, a righteousness by law. But here is also our Father telling us once again that we are free from that burden. We are free. Despite our constant attempts at planning, devising, lawmaking, and law falling, here he is saying, you are free because I said you are free. Our Father breaks through all of our human devising, our righteous plans, and lays before us his grace. No amount of law following will set us free. It will only enslave us to this unnecessary and insane burden even more. Only Christ sets us free by his actions. And this is Paul's allegory of Hagar and Sarah. And this is the message to the Galatians and to you. Because of Christ, you are free. Will the team come forward, please? Now, I would not be a good pastor if I didn't just talk about all of this wonderful good news and didn't hand over this good news to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's one thing to talk about Jesus to someone, and it's another thing to give Jesus to someone. I would not be a good pastor if I did not declare to you that you are a son. All that Christ is has been given to you. That is now who you are. All that you have struggled with and all that you have done has been given to him. And all that he is and all that he has accomplished has been given to you. You are a son and with that an heir to all that God promises. If you have been baptized into Christ, if you have faith in Christ, if you are connected with Christ, you already have all that there is to have and to experience in him. There is no more to get. There is no more fullness to experience than that which comes with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You are sons. You are heirs. You have the fullness of the kingdom already. And it's easy to gloss over the idea that you are sons and an heir. There is no extra. You are a son and an heir. You are able to say, Abba, Father, just like Jesus can. And does. Think about that. You, you who have Christ, you get to call the Father the same thing that Jesus does. It is not just that you have some access to the Father. It is not that you just are a part of his family and kingdom. Christ's access to the Father Christ's place in the family, Christ's security in that relationship, Christ's ability to call up Abba, Father, that is yours. And now if you are going to tell me that you are missing out in some way, Jesus Christ is the fullness that you have. Christ himself can call up Abba, Father, and guess who else can? You. You're a son. Jesus Christ, Son of God, I tell you that you are forgiven. You have the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. I just want son of the king, mightily favored. I'll tell you a little story that happened to me yesterday. I remember when it happened. How oh, George Wicker's here this morning, is he going? George is still there. Uh, we
we were at the car show in Norcross. And I remember the day when this thing happened, his brother Wesley uh, came up to me, and George was standing there also. And he said, he was in charge, I can't remember, he was the head guy with them. Um, what was he with, in charge? Anyway, this big banquet, he was in charge of. God can show you favor, did you know that? He can, I ask for favor every day. I ask the Lord to show me favor in my life. And we had a banquet with uh, Prince Philip, the Queen's husband. They're both passed now. Queen of Great Britain, Prince Philip, uh, was in attendance there. Maggie and I were invited to attend the thing. I think it was through because of our, our business. We were atten attending there. And of course, I'm standing there with the, all my kilt on and all my glory. But, now, I don't have as many medals as old Gunny has, and I don't have a Purple Heart like Commander Co has, but I have my couple of medals that I received from Queen and Country. And I was standing in the corner, and uh, Prince Philip made a beeline. I didn't know this part. I knew the part that I was standing. But from Wesley, he said to us yesterday, he says, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh made a beeline over to you. And he started speaking to him and uh, to me. And the Secret Service said to uh, George's brother Wesley, who's that? And he looked over and he says, oh, that's Derek. And who the, is Derek, he, the Secret Service guy said. And here I was and the Duke came right over to me and he saw my medal ribbons and he asked me where I served. At first I thought he was going to get me into trouble for dancing with his wife, but he never said nothing about that. But uh, God can show us favor in different ways in our life. You're a child of the king. Claim your inheritance. Walk with your head up high, realizing that God is a promise keeper. And whatever he promises to you, he keeps it. I can tell you that for a fact. If anyone here this morning and you're in need of prayer, would you just like to close the service with a time of prayer? I know there are some that need prayer this morning. So you just come forward, and we're going to join together. Prayer team, come and just uh, let's uh, let's pray to the Lord. Remember, it's Him we're praying to. Remember that it's Him that's a promise keeper, and it's Him that we're asking to give you the miracle that you need. So if you need prayer this morning, just come forward. Hallelujah! We're going to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah! Thank you, Father. Wonderful Jesus. Bill, prayer team, come forward. Hallelujah, this morning. Just in the closing moments of this service, it's early, but I would like to just take time to pray for the needs of these folks. Faye Marie is going to Jamaica. Her brother has been living in the streets for years. In our prayer time, we've been praying for him faithfully, and she now has the opportunity to go and, and to bring, meet her hopefully see our brother because he's on the streets and she's had tremendous desire yes. to see him come to know him Jesus like he came to know her. Faye Marie's gone through cancer and many trials and tribulations but yes. one thing she does is she puts her trust in the Lord. Thank so you. this morning as we join together and as we anoint Faye Marie in the name of the Father, the Son Amen. and the Holy Spirit, we pray that the Lord will continue to give her health and strength and soundness of mind, that she'll make a way for her so that she will be able to catch up with her brother and to see him. And as she, the example that she is, she can minister to him just right where he is. His name is Christopher. And we're going to be praying that the Lord will make a way for her where there's no, no way. You've been hearing about it this morning, oft times, and when it happens, we don't believe it, but we have to believe and trust in the Lord. Faye Marie, I'm asking for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to go with you and that you will bless the folks that you see down there and especially Christopher, yes. that you can be with him again and that God will give you that strength and health that you need to do the, give you the desires of your heart. Amen. In Jesus' name, for June, as we anoint this blanket that belonged to her daughter, who is with the Lord now, and we're anointing the blanket so that they could be with June. And the blanket will be used as a comfort for her, that she not look at the circumstances or trials and difficulties in her life, 
But when she looks at this blanket and she sees this blanket, she realizes that she's serving a promise-keeping God and that his hand is upon her and he's going to bring her through not any old way, but wonderfully victorious. Amen. That this blanket will be a, a use of, of hope the Holy Spirit will be with it to minister to June in our dark days and our dark hours when she's thinking all different things, that she'll be set free, Amen. set free from within, and that she'll feel the presence of the Lord as she looks to the blanket. And it comes to her memory that the Lord is in control and he keeps his promises and that he'll be with her and meet her every need. And he'll bring her through not any old way, but wonderfully victorious. And Jesus, your precious name, I ask it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Katie, I just love you, Katie. I love you, darling. I know that you need a healing in your body. And I just pray, Katie, that the Lord will touch your back, that he'll set you free. He'll take away all this pain, and they'll be fixed, that you'll be healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I pray for freedom and liberty and and, and, and just everything that you need this morning, Katie, as you continue to look to him, I pray that your, the Lord is, is, is going to look after you and his hand is upon you and we just stand believing your brothers and sisters as he's here in the midst right now that he will touch you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Be healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Look to him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sammy, I want to pray for you and Gail. I know you've been prayed for before. I've been prayed for myself many times. Sammy, hallelujah. Come here with us, bud. Hallelujah. Gail, you've been so faithful. Sam, you too. And I'm just asking Jesus just to undertake for you in a way that you haven't felt in a long time. Yes, Lord. That the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come back upon your lives or be there stronger Amen. than ever. Amen. That you'll touch your mind, yes, you'll touch Lord. your body in every area. Amen. That you will be healed also. Mm -hmm. But not only in yes, your, in your right. natural body, but in right. your mind and Amen. in your spirit. Amen. And that he'll Amen. set you free yes, afresh Lord. today. Amen. And that you'll look to him. As I've been praying for you in the last few Jesus. weeks, I just ask God Jesus. just to undertake. Yes, like only Lord. he can. Be free. Yes, Jesus. Claim yes, your Jesus. right. Amen. Claim the promises yes, that he's given. Yes, Lord. Amen. And stand on them. In yes. Jesus, your wonderful name. Amen. For both you, Gail, and, and for Sam, too. We just ask a blessing in every area of his life. Set him wonderfully free. In Jesus, your wonderful name. We give you thanks for them. We give you thanks for the ministry. Yes, we give Lord. you thanks for their faithfulness. Yes. And we give you thanks for the support that they've been to many. Yes. And I just ask you, Lord, to give them a hundredfold Jesus. return right now in your precious oh, name. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to be in church this morning. Hallelujah. Look for favor this week. I got a free lunch this week. And then I went into a store. I'll just tell you this little bit. I went into the store to buy the people that gave me the, the bought my lunch. And I wanted to give them a gift. So I'm loading up this bag because it's good to be generous, you know. But I went up to pay. The woman says, your credit card's no good here. No, they didn't decline it. They just said they didn't want me to have to pay for it. And uh, they gave, bought everything for me. And it was expensive. And gave it to me. And said, happy birthday. So I'm like Zach. I like to get gifts. Praise God. Isn't God good? That happened to me this week. So I'm thankful to the Lord. And I look for favor every day. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may his radiant smile always, always shine on you. And thank you for your faithfulness and being here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.